As the Germans go to the polling booths in July 1932, little do they know that they were about to take the first step towards abolishing their own democracy. For even large parts of the majority that are not going to vote for Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party are still about to vote into power a parliament that will enable Hitler's rise to become the Fuhrer of a new Germany, devoid of democracy, devoid of freedom, and devoid of the sanctity of human life. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately, humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. In our episode about the effects of the global financial crisis in 1931 on Germany, we saw how Chancellor Heinrich Brüning had managed to cancel war reparations, but also run the German economy into a deep hole. His effort to cancel reparations was meant to silence the cries from the extreme right, who claimed that the post-World War I reparations and territorial losses were unfair, based on the delusion that Germany had not lost the war. When the Allies do agree to cancel reparations in July 1932, Brüning's government has already collapsed, and an election has been called for the same month. It's an election that comes less than two years after the tumultuous election that saw most of the established parties lose ground to the left and right-wing extremists. Although the center-left Social Democrats are still the largest party, the Nazis have made huge gains and came in second, and the Communists made an unexpected comeback and were now the third largest party. Now, despite these gains, in the grand scheme of things, the German Communists are by now weakened to near insignificance. They have been continuously beat down by both government and their extremist opposition. Support from the USSR is more or less non-existent because Stalin is focused on saving his faltering five-year plan and exterminating the peasant class, especially in Ukraine, which we look at in other episodes. In any case, despite that, the Nazis and the communists are involved in recurring street brawls and public showdowns, cementing an inflated feeling of impending doom among the population. The conflict comes to a peak on January 14, 1930, when Horst Wessel is murdered by Albrecht Höhler. Wessel is a 22-year-old Nazi agitator and head of a Berlin SA squad. The SA, Sturmabteilung, is the Nazi paramilitary wing. Höhler is a communist strongman, pimp, and convicted violent criminal. The murder is actually not political. Hurler is part of a gang that has been hired by Vessel's landlady to evict him over unpaid rent and for having let his girlfriend, an ex-prostitute, move in with him. Most of the gang just happen to be communists because they are acquaintances of the landlady's late husband, who was a communist. But the head of the Berlin Nazis, Joseph Goebbels, soon to be campaign manager of the Nazi election bid, pounces on the opportunity and frames it as a political murder, making Vessel a martyr. The gauntlet has now been thrown down, and the communists pick it up by attacking Vessel's funeral procession, thereby playing right into Goebbels' plans and further cementing the false idea of a political motive. So just as the Reich is going towards new elections in 1930, tensions between the faltering extremists on the far left and the rising extremists on the far right are again in the headlines. Both parties increase their agitation against the established parties throughout the summer as they continue fighting in the streets. While both sides do get more support, it is especially the Nazis who hit home with their anti-reparations and conspiratorial agenda. Four days before the election, Hitler speaks in front of 16,000 people in the Sportpalatz Berlin. Promising to do away with the swindlers, he claims are robbing the German working man of his rights. He says, What we promise is not material gains for just one class, but the increased might of the nation, because this is the only path to power and the liberation of the entire German people. However vague and convoluted, it is a message that resonates. And after the 1930 election, the Nazis see themselves vindicated. They are now a major contender for power they make an adjustment in their agitation. Although the abrogation of the Versailles Treaty remains a central talking point, they focus increasingly 
on agitation against Bruning's austerity measures and the communists. By doing so, they are now framing themselves as the main opposition to everyone. And so the Nazis' violent pursuit of the communists continues to cause unrest. It is by no means so that this pursuit is unprovoked, with the communists also going after the Nazis. However, the SA is far superior in force to the disorganized communist paramilitaries. Throughout 1930 and 31, the political violence continues to further the chaos in Germany. And by early 1932, still Chancellor Brüning has had enough and imposes a ban on the SA. Faced with police crackdowns when trying to agitate unrest, they recede into the background. But Brüning is now losing ground as the Reichstag is getting more and more vocal in its opposition to his policies. One of the loudest voices of dissent is that of Nazi leader Adolf Hitler. Despite the promise of the Allies this past December to cancel reparations, Brüning's play to appease the Nazis has failed. In March 1932, the country goes to elect a new president for a seven-year term. The now 84-year-old wartime leader Paul von Hindenburg is the incumbent. He faces Adolf Hitler and the Communist Party leader Ernst Thälmann. In fact, the only reason the aging Hindenburg is on the ticket at all is to stop Hitler, whom he not only distrusts, but personally detests. Brüning rallies the mainstream parties behind Hindenburg to avoid any splinter candidates. With that support on election day, Hindenburg avoids a runoff vote when he captures an absolute majority of 53%, defeating Hitler, who wins 37% of the vote, while Thälmann is a distant third at 10%. So much for the threat of a communist takeover. But the instability is now coming from within. Hindenburg, who reluctantly takes office, is sick and tired of the infighting and instability. In a move to strengthen the government with a harder leader, he dismisses Brüning and appoints the ultra-conservative Franz von Papen of the Centrum Party in his place. Von Papen envisions a wide-ranging reform of the Republic to increase the executive power of the president and make the government answer directly and only to the president to bypass the Reichstag, the parliament. The goal is to stop the constant rollover of governments unable to govern because of the constantly fractured legislature. His views are outspokenly anti-democratic and he envisions a long-term transition back to monarchy. Already before Brüning is dismissed, von Papen has started negotiating with the Nazis to forge a coalition of the conservatives and the extreme right to govern the largest federal state, the Free State of Prussia, where the NSDAP, the Nazi party, is, after state elections in April, now the largest faction. Now, Prussia covers more than half of Germany and includes the capital, Berlin. So if this state doesn't work, nor does Germany. But von Papen is fully convinced he can, he can tame Hitler and make him fall in line with his ultra-conservative agenda. Or as he will soon say, within two months, we have pushed Hitler into a corner so that he squeaks. The coalition talks for Prussia fail, but von Papen continues to believe that he can find a way to coalition with them. Von Papen's party is one of the smallest in the Reichstag, and he is facing increasing problems to govern, even with the help of emergency decrees by President Hindenburg. In May, he convinces Hindenburg to announce new Reichstag elections for July 31st. Von Papen foresees gains by the NSDAP and continues to court them for a coalition. In an effort to win their support, he lifts the ban on the SA on June 12th. If Von Papen also does this with the goal of Further violently suppressing the extreme left is unclear. Whatever the case, the SA promptly turned the election campaign into a riotous bloodfest as they start attacking political opponents openly in the streets and organize riots and demonstrations which are met with communist counter demonstrations. Predictably, outright battles in the streets follow. When the dust settles, 99 people from both sides will have been killed and 1,125 severely wounded. But for now, von Papen has won the NSDAP to his side, and they promise to work peacefully with him. With the prospect of a coalition to govern with, at the end of June, he travels to Lausanne to negotiate the final end of the reparations. British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald leads the negotiations for the Allies and grants an end to the reparations, but 
insists on a final payment of 3 billion Reichsmark. Von Papen manages to negotiate an unlimited deferral of payment on that final installment, though, and returns to Germany. Here, he is met with a barrage of dissatisfaction from the press and the public, who unilaterally reject this agreement as a failure. The most vocal opposition is again from his new friends, the Nazis, who continue to escalate the violent repression of their political enemies. The situation in Prussia now becomes critical, as this, the majority capital state, sees the greatest unrest but has no functioning government. The incumbents are unable to govern because no one has a majority and no one will form a coalition. On July 17th, the SA organizes a march of 7,000 militants through the town of Altona, adjacent to Hamburg. This is a direct provocation of the left, as Altona is a well-known communist enclave. Predictably, it turns into chaos. Shots are fired from both the SA and the communist counter-demonstrators. Two SA men are shot dead, ostensibly killed by communist bullets, but in fact, as we will find out by forensic research 60 years later, it is shots fired by the police. But for the men in the streets, it doesn't look that way. The SA now call for increased protection by the Hamburg police, who come in force. More shots are fired, leaving another 16 dead, mostly communists, all shot by the police. That same day, von Papen uses the incident to convince Hindenburg to sign another emergency decree that allows von Papen to dismiss the incumbent dysfunctional Prussian government and make himself Reichskommissar of Prussia on July 20th. In other words, dictator of more than half of Germany. And this is at the same time that he is already Germany's chancellor. This is yet another move to dismember democracy in Germany that, like the other emergency degrees by Hindenburg, will soon play a central part in the Nazi power grab. Nevertheless, the violence continues into the election on July 31st, when both communists and Nazis come out in force to fight each other and intimidate voters. 12 people are killed across the Republic. Despite the violence, voter turnout is huge, with 84.2% of the electorate voting. The Nazis make enormous gains, doubling their seats in the Reichstag. With 37.3%, they are now the largest party. The Social Democrats lose 10 seats, but are the second largest party at 21.6%. The Communists of the KPD come in third, with a gain of 12 seats and 14.3% of the vote. Von Papen's Centrum gains 7 seats and 12.4% of the vote. The National Conservative DNVP gains 3 seats and 5.9% of the vote. The losers are the liberal center-right parties that all lose votes and are mostly marginalized. Now, that might seem like a victory for the Nazis, right? But that is not how the press and public see it. Instead, the result is received with relief, as the NSDAP has not captured a majority. Even Goebbels, who led the Nazi campaign, is disappointed. The mainstream party politicians and Hindenburg are terrified, though with the NSDAP and the KPD together now holding slightly more than half of the seats in the Reichstag, that means that under Article 54 of the Weimar Constitution, they can dismiss any government or just block the formation of a government by not voting for it. The likelihood for that to happen is almost absolute. So once again, Hindenburg is the only one that can form a government by emergency decree. Or someone can coalition with the Nazis, right? Well, when von Papen tries to cash in on his efforts to appease the Nazis, he is brutally disappointed. Hitler blankly refuses to honor his previous commitments and instead demands that he be named chancellor. That would require a coalition or support by the president. But no one wants the coalition, and Hindenburg refuses Hitler under any circumstances. Obviously, Germany is set on a path to new elections once again. On the road to them, Centrum agrees to vote for Hermann Goering as president of the Reichstag, which he becomes September 4th. And von Papen tries to continue governing in an emergency cabinet. On September 12th, it comes to a public showdown between von Papen and the Reichstag. The Reichstag has only one point of order on this day, the acceptance of the Declaration of Government by Franz von Papen's cabinet. Instead, the KPD suddenly call for a vote 
to dissolve two of the emergency decrees and to hold a vote of no confidence against von Papen. The NSDAP calls for a 30-minute recess to confer with Hitler. This gives von Papen time to rush back to the Chancellery, where he manages to get Hindenburg to sign a dissolution of the Reichstag. He returns in time to the Reichstag and enters waving the red-taped binder with the dissolution. Under loud boos and insults, he makes his way to President Goering's pulpit and tries to take the floor. Goering ignores him and calls for the vote of no confidence. Von Papen simply slaps the binder on Goering's pulpit and leaves the Reichstag infuriated. The vote proceeds with 513 against 42, approving the KPD's call for no confidence. It is immaterial though. Once the document is on the desk of the Reichstag president, the dissolution is legal and new elections must be called no later than November 4th. As the country once again prepares for elections, von Papen continues to govern. The election campaign this time will be far less violent, but the damage has already been done. Once again, the Weimar mainstream parties have been unable to find a solution to get rid of violent extremists on the right and left, providing oversimplified answers to the problems not only Germany, but the whole world suffers from. In fact, the Weimar government has once again made it worse by using one side of extremists to beat down the other side. Thus, they have now bound to their chest a snake that will grow into a dragon and consume them all. If you would like to know more about Hitler's first attempt to seize power, you can check out our Between Two Wars episodes about the Beer Hall Push right here. Our patron of the week is Charles Rousseau, or Charles Rousseau. I'm assuming French, but maybe not. Anyhow, thanks to people like Charles, we are able to continue making this show just the way it is. So be like Charles and join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Don't forget to subscribe and remember, Snake's poison is life to the snake. It is in relation to man that it means death. Mm -hmm.